voice uh, or uh, the audio engineer will just let me know. Um, today we, uh, we will discuss um, some of the basics uh, concepts for text classification for the Arabic language. I hope you will have valuable time and learn new skills. Uh, just a very uh, short bio about myself. My name is Fatma Hussain. I'm an assistant uh, a professor at the Department of Information Science uh, at uh, the College of Life Sciences in Kuwait University. My main research uh, interest is in Arabic natural language processing. So I try to build uh, different systems to process Arabic language, uh, different Arabic dialects, uh, for um, different tasks, uh, generally in text classification. I'm the founder of the Information Science Lab. You can check its website, has lots of uh, blogs and tutorials that has um, uh, some similar topics to the one that we will cover today. So in, in general, we will um, start with some of them very general uh, definitions and concepts of uh, text classifications, what we need, uh, the different phases of text classification. So we will um, uh, cover some issues that help you to select the right data set for your model. Uh, we will also discuss some exploratory data analysis, um, text uh, reprocessing that are um, general for any language and that are specific for the Arabic language as well. Um, how you need to prepare your data set for any text classification pipeline, feature extraction, classification model, um, how you evaluate your model after you build it using some performance evaluation matrices, and then at the end, uh, how you can conduct error analysis. Um, I just want to make sure, uh, are you with me on the same slides? Uh, because I'm switching the slides. Okay, good. Uh, so in general, what is text classification? How it's used? How um, maybe you, I'm sure that you use some sort of models that are used for text classification, but maybe you're not aware that this is a text classification algorithm or that this application is based on text classification model. For example, uh, if you, ever read a newspaper online or any magazines, you will see that there are some categories uh, that try to categorize different articles into different uh, topics. Um, and these algorithms that they use behind these different categories that you can see in their websites um, are all depending on text classification algorithms. Um, for example, um, even in a Twitter, uh, they also categorize their um, topics, their hashtags under in a hierarchical way in which they use text classification algorithm as well. Um, in Wikipedia, you can see lots of uh, articles. Each article is tagged with different keywords or with different categories, different uh, concepts that highlight each article. This is also depending on text classification. So the uh, the application for text classification are very broad. It could be in sentiment analysis, which gives us the different sentiment, emotions that it might have, either negative, positive, and neutral, things like that. Topic modeling into the different topics, if it's related to nature, politic, economy. Um, even in language detection systems, they also depend on text classification algorithm. Um, I just would like to share with you this email. I got this, I received this email a few months ago and um, I would like to see if you can detect if it, this is a spam or not a spam. What do you think? Just give you a few seconds, try to go through the content of this email and just let me know if you feel this is a spam or not a spam.
you can write in the chatting whether you think this is a spam or not and why you say it's a spam for those who mention spam was there anything that um yeah you said clearly spam clearly spam all the story okay yes good good it's a spam you're correct but uh, there should be some things like specific characteristic features that help us as a human to say yeah, this is a spam how can we categorize it as a spam or not a spam yeah if someone can i just need to good yes yes Yes, the dollar sign usually is this mom, dear friend, because it's very general. They didn't specify my name in their emails and it was sent to me. So if they really uh, knowing me, they should mention my name. For example, the dollar sign is usually come in spam emails. It's one of the most common features in any spam. And the style of writing, um, the famous names uh, that it, it has. So, even the email address that uh, it was sent from, all of these are different features, different characteristics that help to define what is a spam, what is not a spam. So machine is learning exactly like a human, how we look into these different attributes and then we say, yeah, this is a spam, this is not a spam. Machine is exactly like us. This is a task for text classification uh, with the spam. Switching to the second example. This example is from Twitter. So what do you think? Is this an offensive language tweet or not? How would you classify it if you ask to classify it? I think this is a very obvious example. I just want to start with some general examples, you know, a very easy example. That's where human was very easy. No, uh, you mean it? Um, um, yeah, the, the webinar is recorded now, but uh, we will check later if we will publish it on YouTube or not. But yet, it's, it's, it is recorded now. Yeah, so the picture in this tweet is offensive picture. The language is offensive. Um, there are a lot of things that shows exactly clearly that this is an offensive tweet so yes defining what is offensive and what is not offensive for this particular tweet was very easy because of the picture because of um, some content some language content um, even the it's not just the exact like the big bigs for example or just specific uh, words even the way that they are writing it uh, it's clearly it is uh, some attributes uh, for offensive content for machines it's exactly the same they need to have different samples from each label if it's offensive if it's a spam things like that until they learn a specific pattern based on the features that clearly define what is spam or what is for example offensive and then after that it will help to give us an, a label or categorize each new content into its right label if it's offensive or if it is a spam so a general text classification pipeline start with the, the data sets usually we have uh, two data sets we have to have these two sometimes you will see three but the third data set, we will explain it later, inshallah, today, it's not mandatory. The two parts, the training data sets and the testing data sets, are the mandatory two data sets that we need in building a text classification pipeline. And uh, most of the text classification applications are supervised learning, uh, machine learning models. So we need to have uh, some sort of su supervision, humans who label uh, the samples that we have in the training samples and in the testing samples. And by that, we mean that we need to have some 
a human that provide us with the right label for each sample in the data set. So we start with the training part. Uh, we'll separate the label from the samples. We will take the samples, try to clean it, filter it, uh, normalize it, and then we extract features, attributes that are very helpful uh, to our goal from our model. For example, if the model was spam detection, then we have to make sure that the features that we are extracting are the features that will help us for spam detection. And the same for the other uh, taxi classification task. And then after that, we will um, feed it into our supervised machine learning algorithm, depending on the algorithm that we are applying and we are using in our model to train and to develop our model. So here, the learning process will start for the model. It's learning all depend on the data sets that we are providing and the features that we are extracting. The more accurate features we are providing, the more helpful features, the better model we can have. And the larger the data set, of course, that means more experience for the model and more uh, opportunity for the model to learn. And then after that, we use our testing part from the data sets um, to evaluate and to test our model. So we will feed them into the model that we build during the training process, and we will see its prediction, the output, if it's accurate and or not. There are lots of matrices that are used in performance evaluation. Um, and then after that, we can uh, apply it into a, any actual uh, application uh, in an unsupervised way if we are satisfied with the performance of our model. So whenever we check the performance with the testing data and we see that the performance is acceptable, the percentage that is providing is a high percentage, it's very accurate, then we can apply it in an unsupervised manner. So when we want to select any data sets, there are lots of attributes that we need to consider in selecting which data set we have can choose in our model. Of course, not any data set will be suitable. Um, we have to look to, for the data set size. Um, lots of algorithms like the neural network algorithms, the advanced one, they need a very huge and large data set in order to train the model accurately. Um, but there are still some type of algorithms that are suitable for a small data set. So we really need to check for the data set size uh to help us to select the right algorithm for it distribution of the samples by distribution i mean the number of the classes that we have is it binary multi-classes and is it balanced distributed or is not balanced distributed all of that can affect the accuracy of our model and the type of the um, performance measurement that we will select. If they are balanced there are different measurements that we can select uh, if it's not balance uh, the class distribution is not the same for all classes then there are other performance measurements that we can select so we need to consider all of these attributes the annotation of the data set because that's a very integral part in determining if this data set is uh, a safe data set to use or not because really some data sets available online and they are not annotated very well the labels that they are providing are not accurate and then that will directly affect the performance of our model it may be not worth the effort and the time that you will put in developing your model using this data set because this data set is not the right data sets it has lots of uh, mislabeled uh, samples or um, even the language that they have is not the right language for you. Um, so checking the annotation process that was used in building the data set is very important. How many annotators they have? Did they use any uh, annotation agreement uh, measurement uh, to give us some measurement for their accuracy of the annotation process? Because there are a lot of measurement that measure the um, the accuracy or the realistic the, the realistic city sorry for the annotation process so if we have more than three annotators we can define some measurement that measure the agreement between the different annotators if the agreement is very high then this data set is 
a good that is it if the agreement between the annotator is not very high that means that there are some issues with the annotation with that data uh, also the source of the data can affect the um, reprocessing a phase that uh, and the pre-processing technique that we can apply if the source was from twitter for example then we have to apply searching pre-processing to clean up and filter the platform specific attributes uh, or content that might be there like mention like retweet maybe um, some um, short way of writing uh, the language that's commonly used on twitter but if the data set was taken from books, from journals, from magazines, from Wikipedia, then the type of the language that is there is different and the pre-processing skills or uh, technique that we need to apply might be also different. So all of that can affect uh, what we uh, need to apply. Sorry. Okay. So I'll start with this first phase. After selecting the da right data set for our model, we can now start with some exploratory data analysis. The main goal of the exploratory data analysis is to understand our data, to get closer to our data, to know what's in our data. So we try to do some investigation uh, and there are no specific technique that we need to follow in doing the exploratory data analysis. Everyone can define their own way of uh, analyzing their data. If you are interested in learning the nouns, for example, that are there in your data, you can just extract the nouns and count the frequency of different nouns in your data, for example. That could be one way of doing exploratory data analysis. Another way of doing exploratory data analysis could be to see how many emojis are there are there an emoji or no um, punctuations that they are using uh, the length of the samples the length of the words so it's very open the exploited data analysis everything depends on the researcher and what they are really interested to learn about their data if they are interested in learning some linguistic part if they are interested to learn some format part uh, they are interested in learning some grammatical part from their uh, data they can they are free to choose during this phase but the main goal of this phase is to look for some pattern trends that could help you to define the right pre-processing skill and get it closer and know your data better um so that's the main goal from this phase. What comes after that is the text pre-processing. Text pre-processing is like filtering, cleaning your data, uh, preparing your data for the next step. Um, as you know, like most of the data online uh, are very unstructured, very un, uh, unorganized. Uh, especially if it was taken from Twitter, from um, any social media, any chatting websites, forums, they are really not clean. They really need lots of pre-processing, filtering, cleaning in order to uh, make it valuable and make it understandable for our model. Uh, but if the text was taken from textbooks, from maybe encyclopedia, then the pre-processing phase might be less important. So it's also depend on the task, on the source of the data. But in general, we will need to do text pre-processing uh, to filter the unnecessary uh, items in our data um, as a way for dimensionality reduction, reducing the words. Sometimes we remove stop words. Stop words are words that are very very frequent and they are not valuable like uh, the this hair she those some words that are very frequent and at the same time they are not valuable they're not giving us any information that can help us in uh, our task so the main goal is to bring your text into a form that is predictable and analyzable for your task and by your model by the machine the predictive model that you are building and they are not transferable 
what I mean by this is that uh, the pre-processing phase that you define, for example, for offensive language detection, detection cannot be exactly applied to spam detection, cannot be exactly applied for sentiment analysis. Each task is unique. Each data set is unique. You always need to experiment. So try to do some experimental studies before you actually building your last model, the model that you will take it further into uh, the testing data set. Okay, so you can keep uh, experimenting, experimenting using the training part from your data sets and you, you can try uh, different degree processing and see which one can help to increase the performance of the classifier for that particular task and the particular data set that you have. These are just some examples of text preprocessing that can be used for the Arabic language. In the first part here, you see that um, uh, the emoji uh, is converted into uh, a description in Arabic that describes the content of that emoji. This has been proven by multiple studies that's very helpful for sentiment analysis and also for offensive language detection. The second one is dialect normalization, because as you know, I guess that most of the uh, attendants here are Arabic speakers, and uh, uh, they can uh, speak and know Arabic, then, and, and I guess that you might know that there are different dialects for the Arabic language, each dialect might differ from the other in the nouns that they are using or even in verbs in general like there are some variation from the different dialect uh, even sometimes within the same dialect from one region to another people might use different uh, word uh, in expressing what they want to say so we can normalize this variation in arabic dialect by using the modern standard arabic which is the same form of Arabic that is used in writing books and uh, the news uh, uh, paper. So we try to reduce the dimensionality of the different dialect by converting, for example, nouns, because it's the easiest thing to convert, nouns uh, from different dialect into the modern standard Arabic dialect. That can help a lot in dimensionality reduction. Another pre-processing uh, is word categorization, also head to dimensionality reduction, in which we try to um, map different words from different category to their main category. Like if there are different plant name, different flower name, we can just map it into flower. Uh, different animal name, we can just map it into the word animal. Those examples are taken from an offensive language detection project. So I'm sorry if you find some uh, uh, offensive content. I'm really very sorry <laughs> because uh, all of these are examples of from an offensive language detection project. Another uh, way of normalizing the text that can affect the entire content of your data set is letter normalization because uh, different letter in Arabic can be written in different forms depending on the location of the letter. Within the, within the word. If it's coming in the beginning of the word, might be written in a different form than if it's coming in the middle or at the end of the word. And that's true for lots of uh, letters in the Arabic language, like um, ham, uh, fa, lots, um, yeah, for example. So we can normalize that as well by uh, just selecting one form of writing each letter. And you will see how we can uh, bear from that and the second part of from this workshop. Uh, we can also do hashtag segmentation. This is true for all language. Uh, almost all application, they do it if they are taking a data set from a Twitter because that helps a lot. Uh, and uh, during this step, we remove the hashtag symbol. We remove if there are any other characters within the hashtag. We remove them and we just keep the textual content. There are also some miscellaneous uh, cleaning, filtering, like removing uh, platform-specific attributes like mentions, retweet, removing a stop word. Like uh, this example, the stop word was yeah. It's an Arabic stop word. It gets removed. Uh, 
And there are lots of like removing punctuations, removing emojis could be one of the miscellaneous filtering and the cleaning tasks. So we'll get into the next step now, which we, after filtering, after cleaning the data set, we can start with data set preparation for the model. So we take the data set, if it was not partitioned from the beginning, we assume that the data set was just one large corpus. We did the pre-processing phase in the large corpus. And now we want to partition it into training set. If we want, we can have validation, also called development, also called evaluation set, and then the test set. So the training set will be used to develop and to create our classifier. So it will be used as I just saw you in the beginning of the, uh, just show you in the beginning of the workshop, how we use the training part to train our model, to develop our model, how it can help for the learning process of our model. And then, and usually it is the largest part from the data sets. And then there's usually very small bears, a portion of the data is used as a validation. Uh, the main goal from the validation, also called development or evaluation, is to fine tune our parameters, our hyperparameters that are used in the model. Um, so usually it's used to evaluate, keep evaluating, keep evaluating the model until we arrive to the best. Uh, combination of uh, parameters and also pre-processing phase, feature extraction, all of these, the different phases that we can go through uh, through the text classification pipeline can further improve if we have a validation and evaluation set. Because the test set can be, ca cannot be used again and again and again. So when we want to build a model, we have to stack into the training set to develop the model and then use the validation uh, set to evaluate and get back and improve the model further and further and further. But once we use the test set, we cannot get back to the model and evaluate further. That's considered a bias way of, if we, if we did so, that's considered that we are not aware or we are not considering the bias of our model because that's how text classification pipeline should be. The validation set is used for fine tuning and for further improving the model, but the test set no, it should be the last evaluation of the performance for the model. So once we use it, what we get as the result from the accuracy or any other uh, performance evaluation measurements, that's the end, that's the final evaluation uh, of our model, performance evaluation for the model. But what's the performance evaluation that we can get during the validation uh, data sets? That's not the final. We can still have some time to further improve our model. That's why most of the text classification researchers uh, prefer to have a very small portion of their data as a validation to keep improving and improving and improving their model. And then at the very, very end, they use their test set just to make sure that they are accounting for the bias and they are not uh, uh, also losing the opportunity to improve their model. Once we partition the data set and we have the three bars, we can now uh, convert the labels into a numeric format because the uh, machines in general, uh, uh, machine learning algorithms cannot understand text, cannot understand word. They need to be um, contacted or to be, um, they need to speak with numbers, numeric uh, values. So we need to convert our labels into numeric format. For example, if our uh, text classification has offensive, not offensive, we need to, for example, map every offensive tweet into zero, for example, label, every not offensive tweet into, for example, one label. So the main idea here to map uh, any categorical or textual content into numeric. And of course, we need also to map the samples, the tweets, the, the, the textual content into numeric format as well. 
and that can be done during the feature extraction phase. Uh, so the feature extraction, you remember when I told you that we need to define the right features that can help to serve our goal, uh, is uh, the mapping from the textual content into a numeric representation for that samples, for that textual content. And this usually called word embedding, in which we assign particular weight to words that tell us how important they are in the document. There are tons of word embedding techniques. Um, some of them are very, very advanced ones. But for the purpose of this workshop, I will explain only two. Those are the basics, uh, the fundamental that all other word embedding are depending on. The first one is bag of word. And it's called bags because it depends on creating multi sets without preserving the order of the word, but keeping the frequencies of the word. As you can see here, each row is a sample and each column is a word. So the way that we give a weight for each word by just having the frequencies of that word and how, how many times it appears in each row, in each uh, sample. And you can imagine that it will be a very, very high dimensional word embedding for each word. And there might be lots of zeros as well. So uh, it has some uh, problem because it's also not uh, considering um, the order of the words, the relationship between the different words. And uh, also it's not uh giving us any any semantic relationship between the words so i don't know after having the bag of words if this word is related to that word if these two words are commonly come together in the same sample or not things like that and this can be uh, solved by using the term frequency inverse decrementive frequency word embedding uh, the idea is to assign particular weight to words that tell us about how important they are in this document. Uh, for example, the word that, they will have very, very low uh, TF-IDF. It's also sparse, but not in the same way uh, that back of word is doing it, because it is still a preserved some, some semantic relationship between the word and the vocabulary. You can see it has two main parts. In the first part, um, more commonly, we squash the raw frequency a bit by using the log 10 of the frequency in a state. Um, the intuition in here is that a word appearing 100 times in a document doesn't make that word 100 times more likely to be relevant um, to the meaning of the document. Also, we normally add one, as you can see here in this slide uh to the count because we can't take the log of zero if the word never appear uh the second part uh, the second part we emphasize discriminative word by the inverse document frequency frequency or idf term weight uh, which define using the fraction of n uh, the total number of document over the df of the term where n is the total number of the document in the collection. And the DFT is the number of documents in which the term T occur. Uh, the fewer documents in which uh, a term occur, the higher this weight. And the lowest weight of one is assigned to term that occur in all document. Um, because of the large number of documents in many collections, this measure two is usually squished uh, with a long with a log function as well, as you can see here in this slide. And after that, we um, have the final TF-IDF by multiplying both uh, part uh, from the TF-IDF together. So with that, we will have a normalized weight that uh, consider both the frequency of a word within the document and the frequency of a word across all document. Uh, before moving into the next step, I just want to check if there is any questions. Is there any efficient way to detect 
the misspelling in the data sets, yes. Uh, there are some libraries and tools that can automatically detect the misspelled uh, word in the data set and correct it for you. Uh, I can share that with you if you send me an email after that. Uh, I can share that or you can also uh, Google that. You will find a lot of tools that can help in uh, solving this mis. Oh, sorry, mislabeling, not misspelled, mislabeling. With the mislabeling, it's very hard. No, if the data set is not very accurate, I really recommend not to use it because mislabeled is very hard to detect by the model, by the machine. As a human, yes, we can detect that. But if you have a very large data set, you will not be able to take every mislabeled um, tweet, for example, and relabeled it again. Okay, so I'm sorry for that. So moving to the next phase, which is a classification model development, the algorithm development, the main algorithm development, the predictive model that we need to develop now. So um, as you know about machine learning algorithm or model in general, the main features of them that they are computers that can they that they can teach themselves to use data and learn from their experience and by experience we mean here the training portion of the data sets so they can make more accurate decisions and the decision in our case is the right label for the samples that we have um, a classification function to estimate the class for each instance that's the decision that we are looking for in the in our case in our scenario there are many algorithms uh, either machine learning algorithms uh, neural network algorithms um, if we want to choose supervised semi-supervised unsupervised so the number of algorithms our models are a lot but i will give you just uh, two examples from different uh, part of or different uh, type of classifiers. There are some generative classifiers and there are discriminative classifiers. And the way that they work and the way that they uh, define uh, the labels and predict the labels is different a little bit. An example of a generative classifier is naive base, which depend on probabilities and uh, uh, how many time each uh sample for example uh, or each pattern they found in samples things like that and there are also the logistic regression which is considered as a discriminative classifier which is not depending in uh prob probabilities as much as in, uh, is it the case in naive base you will see in this slides what i mean by generative and discriminative classifier so suppose we want um, to distinguish between cat and dog. So we want to build a text classification. Or, sorry, this in this case, it will be an image classification, but the same classification. Model that distinguish uh, between cats. So we have two labels, cats and dogs. And we have a set of images. For a generative uh, a classifier, uh, they will uh, build a model of what in a cat image. So they will look into the cat image and they try to define uh, attribute of a cat. A cat should have that thing, a cat should have that thing, a cat should have that things. And they will look into the dog and also define a specific attribute for the second label, which is the dogs. The dogs should have that thing, that thing, that thing. And so they will come up with a very detailed description our uh, definition of what is the cat, what is a dog, what can define, what best characteristic that can define a cat, what best characteristic can define a dog. And then we will run both by passing some new pictures for dogs and, and cat, dogs and cats, and then see what it will predict. And the prediction will be usually probabilities. So it give us uh, based on the probability, based on the similarities between the new picture with the cat and the similarity with the new picture for the new picture with the dog. If the 
uh, probability was higher for that for the dog class, then it will be classified as a dog. If the probability was higher for the cat class, then that sample or that picture would be classified as a cat. But for a discriminative classifier, they just try to distinguish dogs from cat. Okay, so they will take both classes together and then we'll try to see what make this class different from that. What are the differences? What's the thing that in cat, not in dog? What's the things that is in cat, not in dog? And then based on that, they will define the label. They will predict the label for the new images. So you see how they work in a different way. That's why it's always better to keep experimenting with different classification model uh, try from both type discriminative and also from the uh, generative classifier. So they are working in a bit, little bit different way. The procedures, the steps that they have is not the same. Uh, after that, we do performance evaluations uh, and by passing the testing data sets, um, get the predictions from the system, and then we can calculate uh, some measurement the most commonly used or tra traditional measurement are precision which uh, tell us how many of the returns labels are correct so it's also called positive predictive value it is the proportion of the predicted positive instances that were actually correct precision also range from zero and one with one as the best uh, precision it can be calculated per class as well the second one is recall. As you can see, it's um, it, it, it gives us how many of the labels that should have been returned are actually returned. Also called uh, sensitivity, uh, true positive, it measures the proportion of the actual positive that are correctly classified. And also range from zero and one. Uh, it can be calculated uh, uh, bare class. It might not be a valid choice for some system, if their main goal uh, does not include capturing as many positive as possible. For example, recall is a valid measure for a cancer detection system, for example. Since uh, capturing the disease as early as possible is desired, uh, even if we are not very sure if the patient really uh, have cancer or not. The most commonly used measurement is accuracy. Um, it uh, is a measurement of the proportion of the total number of correct prediction. In other words, the sum of the correct prediction defined by the sum of all predictions. And it's also range from zero and one, but it has some uh, weakness because um, we only have one for all classes. So it gives one overall score, not per class. It also not account for the imbalanced data set with unequal class distribution. So a better one could be the oh, F1 measure, which is the balance between the quantity and the quality of the label. As you can see, it's a harmonic mean. Uh, so it, it considers the trade-off between precision and recall as well. Um, and since most of the most of the cases there are no equal distribution of the classes, it's always recommended to use if one measurement. Uh, once we're done with the performance measurement, we uh, can do error analysis. There are um, different way of doing error analysis, but the most commonly uh, used way and the most uh, recommended way is to do it man manually by doing manual inspection. So we try to human, we need to get help from a human uh, to look into the samples that were misclassified from each class uh, and then try to check if there is any pattern among them, if there is any items, if there is anything that can give us some insight why the model was unable to uh, predict the correct label for the samples. And yeah, it's just a way and um, to cross check whether they are improving your application or not. So with that, we explain the 
main pipeline for any toxic classification in general. And we cover some uh, pre-processing techniques that are specific for the Arabic language. Uh, we will have a break for about uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So I think we will come back at uh, 6.15 after the break um, to look into the coding part and the offensive language uh, project, which is the second part from this workshop. Uh, but during this time, I would like to make sure that everyone is logged into their Gmail and they download the, the Jupyter notebook from this GitHub. I shared the GitHub link in the very beginning from the world. You can check into the chat and you will see that there is a link to uh, my GitHub. It has uh, the Collab project, which we will go through in the second part of the workshop. Um, and if you have any questions on this material that we discuss until now, please let me know. Um, if you prefer to talk or if you... And it again. Yeah, you see, this is the data set. These are the tweets and these... And they also have a header row on the top that's all will you need to look into all of these um, in order to know what is the right way of reading the file so the file is tab separated it's clearly not comma separated they are tab and they have header then you click on row can you see row here on the right side yes you click on row Then you will get this page. Here on this page, you just right click, save as, and you just name it with an extension dot um, TSV because it is a tab separated uh, file. Okay. Need everyone to do the system. So after this one, we can get back into our collab and upload this data set. Just want to make sure that everyone have enough time to download it. Okay, I assume that everyone downloaded. So now we come back to our collab projects. You can see here on the right, uh, on the left side, sorry. You can see here on the right side, you have this icon to upload uh, to the session. So now the data set that you downloaded, you can now upload it. Easily just click on it and upload it. I download them, I think it's uh, this, oh, yeah, it's here. TS, we look into it and upload it. Then you need to upload it. Wait a little bit, to, sometimes it take very long time depending on your network. And you will see when it's, done downloading uh, sorry uploading the file it will show with the other files in the directory on the left so that's the first step you need to do how you down choose or select the data set you look into the data sets you make sure what how the data set is formatted that will help you how to in using the right condition to read the file and then you upload the file into your directory. Then after that, we will read the file. How we read it? Uh, we need Banda Data Frame Library. It's a library that helps us to read files and put it in a format that is similar to a table. 
it's called data frame and the library is panda so we define it uh, using this command read csv but because it is separated by a tab we need to define that make it clear that this is our file name but the separator between the column is a tab and it has a header the header is at row zero because if we didn't write that it has a header it will assume that there are no header and it will use the headers tweet and the class as a sample so it will treat the word tweet as a sample as a document as a tweet and it will treat a class as one of the classes and that will create a very big problem later when we want to develop uh, the classifier because there are no class called class for example and this one is in english while everything is in arabic so i've just something that you need to take care of when you are reading the file we call it data set because this is the entire corpus the entire data we still we didn't split it okay and this when you just write the name again in collab it will print it directly print the entire data set for you but of course there are no enough screen uh, space to print the entire data set, so it will take samples from the very top samples and then the very last samples but it will give you the in general the format or the shape of your data frame so that my, our data frame here will have um, uh, 5080 846 rows and two columns that's the shape of our data sets that we will work with after that we will do an exploratory data analysis as i explained in the first part from this workshop and the technique that i will use are very generic technique like counting the number of words per tweet counting the number of character per tweet the average number of character per word counting the number of stop word per tweet counting the number of emoji per tweet overall data statistic why we why i chose this because these can help my goal which is offensive language detection hate speech detection people usually use a lot of stop word like yeah yeah and anti you things like that when they want to uh, refer to someone in an abusive way or hate speech way uh, another thing that study found that uh, abusive content usually use very short tweet uh, so they just directly say the bad things or if they want to use some abusive words so i want to analyze that is that correct or not some hypotheses that kind of hypotheses that i want to test also the use of emoji is important because i will use uh, emoji conversion during my pre-processing because it have been shown and proven uh, for its um usefulness in abusive language detection and in sentiment analysis so i want to make sure that this data set has any emojis or no before i apply my pre-processing technique so first um, i think this is a repetition you don't need this skill actually we just need this because this has everything but i just want to make sure that i run this one so i want to run it again and here um, we need these libraries in order to do the steps that i just explained so we need to install emoji library that can read emojis nltk library is um, the library that take care of anything related to nlb natural language processing uh, things related to stop word, things related to punctuations, string analysis, you will need NLTK. So we download NLTK. For this part, we particularly interested in stop word, and these stop words that I need are from the Arabic language. So this is the way that we define it and pass it into the NLTK library and download it. After that, uh, these are the way that we can analyze the length of the, the tweets, average word, sentence, um, word equals sentence split because we want to create 
words, not sentence. So we take each sentence and split it into its pieces, its word, and then we count the number of words we have. That's a very simple way. Counting emoji, we have um, the emoji library. It has its own emoji count. So I, you don't have to write anything in detail. It's very simple. Just now with the library and use their functions. They have specific function for image count, which will return a number for you. And then after that, we add everything into the same data frame that we define, the big data frame. So I define a new column called, called word count and just apply the word count uh, function that I define on the top to it. Character count, the same thing. Um, and then we have average character pair word. We apply the average word functions that I define. So these are all given in the libraries that we are using in LTK library. STR means a string, and it's one of the functions that is provided by the NLTK library. You don't have to. Uh, uh, to write a lot, uh, uh, invent your own functions, very simple. And when you use these bit to use libraries, it's more accurate actually than writing your own function. And then uh, I define a new column for the stop board and I pass uh, the sentence the same way uh, to the uh, um, to an uh, a loop that can take this sentence, split it, and check it with the storyboard that were downloaded from the NLTK library and see if there is a match, then the counter will increase by one. If there is a match, then the counter will increase by another one. And that's the way that they count the number of storyboard in each tweet. Emoji counter is exactly the same way. Use emoji uh, counter. That's it from the emoji library. And the same thing we pass it and it's just count the number of matches. And that's how we count the emoji count. This is not a necessary step. I just want to see um, in an ascending order uh, what will be the head of the data set. So if you if you if you do this step, you sort the values based in ascending order, and then you click dataset dot, dot head it will give you the head of the data frame the table that you have head means the top one uh, based on the order that i define to them okay and you can see when i when i don't specify what exactly should be organized in an ascending order well, here I specified actually word count, but if you're not specifying what exactly, it will assume that the first column is the one that you want you want to format based on it. Okay. Sorry. But here I specify, and it is it was the first column, so it gives us the first column, which is word count. Okay. So if there is any question. I'm sorry if the content has some uh, offensive word. Um, this is the topic of the data sets. And please accept my apologies. After that, we can use this command, uh, dataset.mean. This is, this is provided by the Banda data frame. So because the format of the data set is based on Banda data frame, we can use actually this feature. Mean access zero, it gives us an entire statistics about everything in this data frame. Of course, everything in numeric, that has a numeric type. So for word count, our data set has a mean of 12.76 word per tweet. Character count per tweet is about 63. 6. Average character bear word is about 
three characters. Top word is about only two top word, not a lot. The tweet. Emoji counters are very, very few emojis in our data sets. You can see it's about 0 0.01 emoji per tweet. Means we have very, very few emojis. So the pre-processing steps, I'm not expecting it will help a lot to convert emoji into a word. Might not help for that particular data set. Not for our task only, you know, for the task and that particular data set because it doesn't have a lot of emojis in it. Okay. Until now, you can actually always download the, the data frame using um, two CSV command um, and from Google Colab, you have to import files. This is the module that you will need in order to download any data set that you are using. And then uh, you convert your data set to a CSV format, comma separated file. That's what we mean. And we need this encoding format since we have Arabic language. Because you have lots of Arabic language, you have to specify that you are using the UTF-8 SIG format. And then you download it using this command, which is imported from the collab files dot download and you specify the name of your file okay i want to run this one again i think i didn't run it just want to make sure that i'm on the same page with you and everything is run correctly there are no problem if you have any problem or something is not running correctly please just let me know. I will look into the error message that you have, okay? So until now, since it's run on my computer, it should run the same way on your computer too because this is Colab. That's the nice thing in Colab that uh, it's not depending on our devices. It's depending on Colab itself, okay? So if it's running on my computer, it should be the same on your computer. And if we want to run this command, I just want to make sure that the command is running correctly because it was, yeah, good. See, it's downloaded directly. Once you run it, it will get downloaded. And then you can open it and check its content again. After that, we get into the text pre-processing. Uh, for uh, this workshop, I will just use top word removal, normalization. You will see what type of normalization I will use. Removing punctuations, converting emoji, and noise removal. Noise removal has some um, um, very generic cleaning steps. The same thing uh, for stop word, I will use uh, NLTK, the same library that I used above to count the number of stop word and uh, you will also need a tokenizer uh, i'm not sure if i use this one word tokenizer yeah yeah you need it you need the word tokenizer because you need to tokenize each word tokenize means you separate each word separately so i want to make sure that i have each word in uh, a separate format with a space between each word with another and then after that um, we tokenize them and we pass it and we check uh, each word with the stop word uh, that we just download from NLTK and see if there is any match then we remove it if there is a match remove that match if there is a match remove that match and uh, for accuracy case I put a condition, a, min a minimum condition. It's always recommended to use a condition. When you remove the content, just to make sure that there will be no empty tweet. Because what if we have a tweet that just contains top word, nothing other than a stop word. If I keep removing all the stop word, I will end up with some rows that have empty tweet. And that can also create a problem for my classifier later on. Okay, so just for accuracy and for this reason, I add a condition to make sure that no tweet will end up with less than two words. 
so keep removing the stop word as long as this tweet has a minimum of two word so that's a condition just to make sure that i don't get into any problem later and then after that i define a new column i call it no stop tweet and i apply my stop word removal into the main tweets in the tweet column and save it in a different column for no stop you can see i will run it again to show you how it will look like yes you can see here yes you can see here now we have our data sets this is the tweets that we have these are this is the main tweet you see that some tweets has only one word that's a very big problem in this data set and then this is the classes that's the things that they provide to us from the author of these data sets not me this is the word counter that we did during the exhibitory data analysis character counter obviously these are all columns from the exhibitory data analysis this is the first column that we have in the pre-processing no stop or the tweet so we have it in a separate new column i will i will show you why we need each step to be in a separate column why i'm saving the result in a separate way uh, for each step that you will know that later inshallah the second step after that is normalization normalization uh, it could be normalizing uh, the number of characters as i did here in the first uh, on the first line here so i remove any three or more repetition of any character any character we have sometimes people especially in offensive they want to emphasize on assertion word they repeat a lot a lot a lot a lot a lot an example for example uh, mabruk some people when they want to write mabruk because they want to show that they are very happy they write wa 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 mabruk a lot very long right or r is very lots repetition a lot of repetitions so we want to normalize that and reduce this repetitions into some sort of a normal number of repetitions so i'm minimum two three remove three sorry or more so if it's three remove it and two two reduce it into minimum of two okay that's one of the repetitions uh, normalization that i did another uh, normalization normalize elif as i just mentioned in the first part that uh, we have different form of writing some letters we can normalize them by just selecting one way of writing these are the codes that we have uh, for each letter uh, for each form of writing each letter so here i'm specifying that replace this by this so hamza below with letter alif and this one hamza with letter alif hamza not below but i remove it because it created some problem for me later so i just remove it to uh, comment it just to make sure that i'll not get any problem another one is alif with madda above to with alif only Alif with Hamza above with letter you, you you can choose which letter you want to replace with okay there are lots of other way of normalizing the letters I also normalize ta for example to make sure that all ta marbuta is replaced with ha so I just want to have ha I don't want to have ta marbuta and ta marbuta I just want to normalize that because people usually write write it they switch between ta and ha and they don't know what when they should use ta and when they should use ha so just make it all ha and make it easier for the model uh, normalize yeah normal into alif maqsura the same thing here i remove the the diacritics al tashkil alamat al tashkil fatha this is fatha i remove it totally remove uh Al-Kasra, uh, different type of Fatha, different type of Dhamma, Shadda, Sukoon, all uh, Tashkeels is removed because we actually uh, using Twitter datasets. So Tashkeel usually is not a lot 
in this type of data. Okay, and then after that, I apply it similar to the stop word removal. I take the main column, the tweet column, the first column that is provided by the author, and then apply normalize method that I just defined and save it into a new column, normalize the tweet. And in this case, we want to build on top of the stop word removal, right? So later on, when I want to build my model, I want to pass the fully preprocessed text into that model, right? So I will have another column that has the text with that have been go through all of these steps. So I added another column. I call it text, just text. Uh, because it's not the real, real raw tweet, so I just call it text. And then I um, talk what I got from the no stop word uh, tweet column and apply the normalize into the no stop. So the normalize will be a second step after removing a stop word here in this case, and it will be saved into the column that's called text. This column actually text is the one that I will use further in building my model and in uh, creating my training data sets and testing data set. But I still need to have the result from each preprocess saved in a new column because that will help me in my error analysis later. We will see uh, if any of these can help me to define any better for the set of tweets that my model cannot uh, understand, cannot predict their true label. Okay, so I'll do the same thing here and run it. Yes, it's working. Uh, print the head of it, so see the top samples and how it has, it's working. And you can see that, yes, the text the, um, has, Tweets that uh, are pre-processed both uh, they um, normalize the letters and also there are no stop word. Continue to the next step, which is removing punctuations. Here we will need two libraries, string library that can deal with the string, and we also need um, the regular expression library. This library is a regular expression library and what we mean by regular expression, it give us it give us the um the the tool to define a specific pattern. So if I want to remove a specific patterns from my text, I can use regular expression library and define the patterns that I don't I no longer want it to exist in my data set. Pattern and language. You will see how that can be used. So I define my own Arabic punctuations. And then I imported the English punctuation from string library. This library string has the English punctuations. Uh, but uh, the English punctuation that it will give me is not in the same format of the Arabic punctuations that I define myself. So I need to reformat them using this command, converting the format into a format that is exactly similar to the format of my Arabic punctuation that I define by myself. And then after that, I merge them all together into one punctuation, large punctuation list that has both English and Arabic. I need both because people on Twitter usually use, they switch between Arabic and English, right? So sometimes they use Arabic punctuation, sometimes they use English punctuations, especially if they want to write emoticons, for example. So I need them both to be more accurate and inclusive for all punctuations. That's why I use them both. And then after that, I remove them, um, just loop into my um, tweets and see if there is any match with uh, the punctuation in my list. Please remove it, uh, switch it with uh, uh, space okay and then after that we did the same thing exactly save the result into a new column uh, attach that column into my data frame and also take the result I got from the previous step which was uh, 
removing stopwords and normalization and further pre-process it using removing punctuations and save it into the same column which is text so text in this case is updated every each pre-process step okay This is um, this is a different command that we used before. If you remember, before I used head dot head to print only the first few rows from the data sets. In this case, I use sample dot five. This is another different uh, command. In sample, it will randomly sample uh, some rows from your data sets for you, not necessarily the one on the top. But in head, no, it will give you only the one on the top. Of the data frame and sample node will be uh, randomly selected based on the number that I provide it will give me the number of rows so if I select five it will randomly select five samples from my data set and show it to them to me as you can see here okay you just run it make sure that there is no problem no problem so you should also have no problem now we convert the emojis as I just explained earlier that uh, studies uh, proven the uh, the increase in their performance after uh, mapping emojis into uh, description that explain the content of their emoji. So uh, we have this repository, this GitHub repository that has lots of content uh, that are very helpful for Arabic emoji conversion. So you will need to go to it and download this file, emoji.csv, in order to uh run this step in this collab so i will do that with you now so just a click on the link provided in the collab go to this uh, repository okay you will need to go to the arabic test to be process you see this file emoji.csv you just a click on this one and now you go to raw similar way but before you, you go to raw you you should notice here that this is not a tab separator okay you see there is a semicolon this is a semicolon that separate the two column is there a header no there is no header on this one okay so this file has no header this file is separated by a, a semicolon so the way that we will read it, the way that we will save it is also different. CSV, not TSV. TSV, if it's tab, this is CSV because it's not tab separated. I have it, okay, but okay, so I don't need to save it. Okay, get back into our, after downloading it, I save it, it. We come back to our collab, just in the same steps that we follow earlier. You go to the left side from your screen. You press on the upload icon and you select your emoji file. Emoji.csv open. Okay. So we have it. Everyone, I just want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Yeah, for I think you're asking you about the code that I'm using for Tashkil and for the different form of writing letters. Yeah, there are actually a very long uh, list. You can you can actually check that online. You will find a um, lot of uh, codes uh, for different Tashkils or for different uh, way of or form of writing letters. There are libraries, lots of libraries online that can help you also to define and uh, borrow their code. Okay, so now we will read 
the new file, the emoji.csv file. And the way that we will read it is just simple. I just, you will find all of these contents from their uh, repository, the repository that we just download the emoji.csv from. So this is, this, this piece of code is not written by me, it's just by the author of this tool, the emoji conversion tool. So they try to stripe the text um, uh, and you will see how they categorize each emojis or the set of emojis in a different way. So here they provide uh, some patterns, some specific emojis that they see that they were very important for them. And the way that's for this, this one, for example, is emoticon so from two. The way that you should read it, it's from two. So it's not just one. The way that they are writing it, maybe it's not very clear, but it's actually, it's, each of these row contain a list of emojis. So they mention here what this list is. This The first row is for the emo, emoticons, the second one for general symbols, then this one for transportation, uh, yeah, they have it here, map symbols, this one for the flags, okay? So, and then they put it into, uh, after reading it, they put it into another uh, variable here that we will use data. And then how the way that they translate it, they try to define categories um, for emoticons, they define emoticons as well. So these are love, these are, for example, smile faces, these are sad faces, these are neutral faces. You will see how they add faces into it. These are the different type of eyes that people use. These are the noses that people use when they want to write in social media in general. I provided it because it's really very helpful. This feature and their tool is really very very important and lots of studies shows their uh, productivity uh, and how to boost the performance of their classifier. But for our case, for our data set that we are using, it doesn't it's not it doesn't have lots of emojis as you notice from the exhibitor data analysis. That's why it's I don't I'm, I, it's not helping a lot, but maybe for another data set it will help a lot. So it's really very nice. It's worth to look into it and add it into our workshop. So these are the smile faces and how they create after the nose, the eyes that they define on the top. Now let's see the faces. The smile faces will have this. The sad faces will have this as a mouth. And then there is the neutral faces. This is their mouth. This is the and reverse, reverse, they are the smile, the other sides, if it's written in a reverse format. And this is the sad faces, this is the neutral faces, okay? And then they create a set of list based on what they just define on the top. And after that, what they did is that is they split it and they give it a tag. If it's in love, then a bent the word hope. If it's in a smile face, if the word was in a smile face with the list that they just define, because they define different combination for each type, for each list, right? You see how they define eyes and then they get further into it and define different type of mouth is depending on sad, uh, happy, neutral, and then a combination of this will have different tag, right? So if the combination fell into love, then Replace it with the word hub. If it's if the combination fall into smile face, please replace it with the word mudhik. If it fall under neutral faces, replace it with adi. If it fall in the sad faces, replace it with, replace it with mahsan. Okay? And then after you replace the emoticon or emoji, please join the other word together, the text. And return back the new text. So this new text will not have any emoji. Okay, it will have one of these categories that we have in the top. If there is emojis, if there is no emoji, it will return back the same exact tweet that we have. Okay, they get help of all of these translate emoji, uh, add space. You will need all of this in order to run the above defined 
you don't get you don't need to get into every single detail of these but this is the main idea just give you the main idea what this tool is doing okay so you just copy the tool copy all the methods they have under understand what it what it does to your uh, text in order to know if will help it will help you or not for your task and just similar to what we did above we define a new column for clean emoji tweet um, we take the raw tweet that's provided by the author we preprocess it by only this preprocess step emoji conversion and save it in a new column and then we take the text text column which already proceed by all the preprocess system we defined earlier and we further preprocess it by the emoji conversion okay i will run it now and see if it doesn't have any error we'll see now inshallah no error Yes, no error. See, it's hard because it becomes very, we have lots of columns now. Clean emoji tweet. Okay. But because our data doesn't have lots of emojis, so we cannot see anything here on the head. No, not a lot in the head. Okay, no emojis actually. Even if we look to the main tweet, none of the one these tweets has emoji. That's why we cannot tell how it's processed. But later on, we will. I will download the output file after we are done with all the preprocess and see together how can we check the results for each preprocess step by looking into its separate column. After that, we uh, we do noise removal, and during noise removal, we define just anything that you see is important you and you feel like it's better to remove it because it might create some confusion to your model you can remove it for example in this case i define um i, do, I don't want any white extra white space so i define this regular expression uh, so i use the regular expression library and uh, the expression that i define is that this one this one means that space slash s refer to space and when i write the word add means more than one space so if there is more than one space one after the other please replace it with only one space this is only one space so please replace any more than one space with only one space and give me back my text that's the meaning of this regular expression this regular expressions remove uh, more than one number so please when you see uh, numbers um, no matter how long is it, please replace it with only one space and give me back my text. I apply it and save it in a, uh, in a column called a clean tweet. And also I took the text column that have been pre-processed by all pre steps and pre-processes further. It's running, there are no mistakes, no error messages. Um, just print the first, not first, sorry, sample five. So it will choose randomly five samples. That's what it should do. Here, yeah, here after doing all the pre-process, before we prepare the data sets, I prefer to write the column, uh, the command again to download the output. Uh, that can help me to see in my eye what's the difference in, in each pre-process step is doing to my data. Uh, is there any step that I feel it's harming, not helping, things like that? You can do that, but um, I prefer that you do it uh, later because I don't want to take more from the workshop time. I prefer to make sure that we will reach the end point of the workshop as I intend before I get into more detailed items. So we'll go into step four step four preparing the data sets as i just explained that during preparing the data set we need to split the data sets in this workshop for uh the purpose of this workshop only i just have train and test but it is always recommended to have also a development set 
okay to fine tune your parameters because during this workshop i i don't think i will have time to fine tune parameter and explain to you what we mean by the different parameters uh, how can we assign different values how can we go through the different values how can we select those different values that's will need an entire workshop maybe three hours to uh, define those parameters for each algorithm that's why i prefer not to use the development data set because the main goal from the development data set is to fine tune the parameters of your model in order to arrive to a better performance and uh, it's hard to explain all of that in one workshop so the purpose of this workshop is to explain the basics and inshallah we will have more workshop to explain how we can fine tune parameters so first i shovel my data sets just to make sure that my data set is not biasly distributed if there is for example if the head of the data set has only one specific label um, by shuffling the data set i will make sure that it will be randomly organized so there will be no specific labels that come on the top or um, when i split the data set it should not get affected by the label distribution or the format of the data sets after that i split it into 20 test set and 80 train set and the way that we split it we can use this this is actually uh, a, um, a, a module or a feature that can be imported from uh, a ski learn li library uh, which is very very important to use because this module can help you to ensure having um, distribution that is exactly the same from the main data set so by using this function i make sure that the distribution of the train data set is equal to the distribution of the test data set and it's equal to the distribution of the main data set okay and by distribution i mean the number of each samples is uh, having the same proportion in all of these three data sets so even if they are not evenly distributed the same proportion will be reserved in all of them okay random seed is very important to define for the reproducibility purpose if you want to reproduce the same step further and further you want to run the same uh, experiment again and you want to make sure that you will have exactly the same results every time you, you run it you need to have random state uh, defined here in this command okay so now we have just run it make sure we yes we have now this is the train data set just a splitting then i also run the test data set make sure we have test data set you can see here the train has about 4676 samples while the test data set will have around 1170 samples because it's 20 percent from the, our data sets and to show you that we really have exactly the same distribution for all of them i just run this uh, math plot which uh, plot a histogram for uh, each data set to show you the distribution this is the main data sets uh, you can see uh, the normal is the top one uh, then we have abusive then we have hate the number of sample from each label here i run it for the train part we should have exactly the same proportion so normal should remain the top yes then abusive then hate exactly the same for the test we should also have the same normal is the top abusive and then hate so yes we have exactly the same distribution for all portions from my data now we come into mapping the labels into number so um, normal is mapped to zero abusive is now mapped to one hate is mapped to two and then i run it and save it into a new column i call that column offensive because the main column if you remember that has those categorical label was a class the one that's provided by the author now i need to rerun it convert it to numeric and save it into a new column offensive which i will be using for the next step i will do the same for train and for test as well 
Now we move into the classification model development. Uh, for the purpose of this workshop, I will use very simple classifier, the logistic regression, which is a traditional classifier. Uh, it's widely used uh, as a baseline model. So when you read the new literatures and new papers and new publications, you will notice maybe that most of them are using logistic regression as a baseline model, not as the main model, because there are more advanced models now, the neural network model are the dominant one, but they still refer to logistic regression as a baseline model, because actually uh, the root or the starting point from building a neural network is logistic regression, okay? Um, so we will extract from the training and from the testing data set only the text that have been pre-processed by all pre-processing steps and only the labels that have been pre-processed to be converted to a numeric. And then we will pass it into a module called pipeline, make pipeline. This module is provided by this library, the sklearn library. And it helped us to define the features that we will use. We will use the TF-IDF vectorizer, the one that I just explained earlier. Okay, so that will be the features that we will use. It will provide a weight uh, for each word in our text. And the classifier that we will use is the logistic regression classifier. And I actually also use something called bar parameter grid. Parameter grid is very helpful. It's similar to fi fine tuning parameters, okay? But it's done uh, by the uh, skill learning library itself. So I define a set of parameters. These are the parameters that I give it. And then I told him, please use a parameter grid to make sure that I'm using the best value from this list. So it will automatically run the model with all of these values, and it will take portion from my training data sets to test all of these values and return to me the values that gives better results for my, uh, for my classifier. And that's how it works when I say grid, uh, grid search. So here I define my grid parameter. And then I pass it to a grid search. That's the meaning of this. That's what this module is doing. So a, a grid search, please take my parameter grid and um, take my pipeline that I defined. This is my features. That's how I tell this is my feature. This is my classifier. And I need also to have um, CV equal five. CV equal five means please when you classify my data, classify it into five portions. Every time you, you run it, run it into five portions, not as one chunk, okay? That can help because we'll reduce bias. If there is any bias in the entire chunk, when we partition it into small, smaller, 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 and then take the average performance, it will be better actually, okay? And then we fit the model using the training features and the training target. Train features is the vectorizer that we created from the text. A train target is the offensive column that we have, the numeric label. Then we will make the prediction using the predict model.predict module. Uh, so we will pass the test features. Uh, the TFIDF for the testing portion without passing the label because we don't not, don't want it to cheat so we give it only the features the TFIDF for the testing part and then we ask it to predict the labels we will take the predictions and pass it into the accuracy uh, score module to give us the result for the performance of our classifier and then we will bring the classification report Okay, we'll run it and see how it will work. So 
are all the libraries that I'm downloading. You see, this is the accuracy score, a 79. Okay. We have a three labels, exactly how we define. You see how we explain in the uh, first sections that for recession, recall, if one, it's better than accuracy in term of that it can be calculated for each class separately. So if there is any problem, just by looking into this, the first portion, we can tell that for F1 score, a class two, which was, I think, hate speech, has very big problem because it is the lowest F1 score. And the best class is the normal one, which is zero. It has the highest F score. And that can be further explained by looking into recall. You can see that the recall is really very good here. It's 91. While for this one, it's not that much. For this one, it's totally not good. Precision here is good. You can see what's each the, these number can tell you now because you already understand the difference between precision recall of one. And the meaning of support means the number of samples. So we the number of samples and the testing. This is all done in the testing portion of the data sets. For the testing portion of the data set, the total number of samples was 1,170. From them, 771 were normal, 301 were uh, abusive, and 98 were hate speech. Accuracy that combine uh, the correctly predicted samples from all labels shows that it was about 79%. It's not so bad, it's still good. Uh, macro average means the macro average for uh, precision, recall, and F1 score. Weighted average is the weight, the, the way that it gives for each uh, sample is not explicitly stated. So we cannot tell how much is, was the weight for each of these samples, but that's the algorithm that the performance that we can look into it. Usually, it's the best the best way to measure the performance by looking into accuracy and by looking into the F1 scores. That's what people usually look into it, F1 scores. And you can look into each label to make sure that where is the, the problem, which label has the problem. After that, you can do, I think this is the same thing we did here. We just repetitions, so... It will print only the report, but it's the same, yes. If you want to have the report in a, in a separate uh, section, you can just print this one. If it was hard for you to look into the result here. Now we move into error analysis. The main, the main goal from error analysis is after you're done with the testing data sets, you cannot get back into fine tuning, right? You cannot get back into uh, the parameter you so that you define. So you can actually try to define some patterns or look into the misclassified samples from each label and manually define what might be the source of error, the source of noise, why my model was unable to classify these samples. Okay, so to do that, we did, uh, we take the testing. Uh, data sets, the predictions from the uh, classification model, and uh, we add it into our uh, data frame for the testing. And then we uh, classify uh, or take only, extract only those that were misclassified for each class. For example, for the normal error, we print them here. Those are on this data frame include only the normal tweets that were misclassified by the classifier. We did the same for the abusive error the tweet that were misclassified, and we did the same for hate speech actually that were misclassified. And then after that, it's always better to download them. We download them in an easy to read format in a tables, and then we can look into each one of them 
need to allow it to download multiple files because if you want to download multiple files, we need to give permission to collab. And then you can look into each one of them and uh, try to look for some patterns and uh, do that inspection manually by yourself. Um, want to see if there is a question? Isn't a good idea to translate number to word in a tweet? This could be a very nice idea, yes. It depends on the domain of your uh, task for text classification. Yes, I agree with you. I Actually, I didn't see anyone who did that before, but it's a very nice idea. Yeah, I really encourage you to develop some tools to map numbers into word there. Uh, and uh, the word format of writing the numbers, it, I think it would be, it could help for searching for some specific domain, I'm not sure, maybe. But for the offensive language domain, I don't think that will help because there are not a lot of numbers that appears in the tweets. But maybe for other domain, yes, it could help. Or actually, if it's helping you just... Uh, skip the steps for pre-processing in which I remove the numbers. Maybe you can skip that step if you feel that the numbers are important. You can keep all numbers in your data set. Don't remove them if you feel that they are important. I remember for some of the data sets um, in English language, they um, it was very important for them to have years in their data sets. That's what they discovered, that the years were very important. Some people discuss their um, historical um, problem, thing like that, their stories. And when they mention their stories, they mention the year that they uh, get through a certain um, experience. And they found that the numbers in years are very important, so they didn't remove years from their data set. They remove any numbers that has a format that is different the format from a year. So yes, maybe. Uh, it could help depending on your domain. So yeah, I just mentioned here some uh, citations. So please, if you use any from the content in this workshop, feel free to use it. It's available uh, for the public on my GitHub. But please do cite my GitHub and any sort of writing publications uh, or blog writing and just to preserve for the copyright um, and you can check actually the misclassified samples we i will open just one of them with you the normal one and see how can it look like Can you see it? I, I think I have to share my screen. Stop sharing this. Yeah, just let me know if you can see the... Can you see the, um, the Excel sheet? Okay, good. You can see the Excel sheet. Okay. So, yeah, this is the Excel sheet. Now you maybe get an idea why we need each pre process step, each uh, exploratory data analysis step in different column for this step, for the error analysis step. It's very important to have an inclusive view to everything related to your data to be able to clearly define the patterns that, that, that were misclassified by your model. To build a better model so this has for example this has word count is there any pattern for example character counts they're all of these missing classified has a specific for example threshold if we define threshold of 20 are all of them above a 20 can we say that any tweet that is above a 20 character count has some difficulty in defining 
its label, uh, is there any relationship between the number of character with the misclassified samples, is there any relationship with the number of stop word with the misclassified sample or average character bear word, things like that. We can, these are, these are the main things that we need to do during the manual inspection for the error analysis. And then we can look into each versions from the data sets and see if really any of these pre-processes tip were helpful or not. I guess for the emoji conversion, I don't think it's very helpful because we really do not have a lot of emoji. Okay, so you, know, you need to do this in a customized way based on each task, based on each data set. See, these are the raw text. This column has, column B has the raw text. And you can see that the raw text has lots of very short tweets. This could be one of the buttons that short tweets act, are actually the one that were misclassified. Another thing could, we can say that tweets that has no emojis also were misclassified. Maybe we need to further assess, further evaluate uh, by looking to the other labels as, as well. Okay. So these were classified as C. They were classified as abusive. And their real label was normal. But actually something is that I feel like some of them are mislabeled by the gold label by the annotators, right? If you look, if you look to like in fact ala halik for example, it's normal. Yes, this one could be maybe could be abusive, right? It could be abusive. While the author classified as normal. So that give us some indication about this data set that maybe it is not very accurate data set. Maybe the annotators uh, are not accurately label these data sets because some samples that were misclassified are actually not normal. So they define it as normal, but they are actually not normal. Is it normal? Isn't it some sort of sarcastic? So it has some sort of sarcastic. So sarcastic tweets are hard for our model to classify correctly, right? That's one thing that we can look when we are. Here, this one. Is it classified as normal? the gold label for it while if we look to the content of it it has lots of bad words i'm sorry i don't know the names those names i'm not familiar with politics especially in levantine so i'm really very sorry but the word al fashion for example is a bad word is an not something normal why they define it as normal so that might create some confusion for our model our classifier. That's why our classifier was unable to classify it as normal. That could be the reason, right? But this is the way that how you how you do manual inspection. That's what I mean by manual inspection. That you go through each sample that was misclassified. Try to look why my why my model is unable to classify it correctly. Why it's normal? Why my model think it's not normal? And this is the way. So you, you look into each one of them and see شوف يا أخي شوف the way yeah شوف yeah it could be uh, a way that people usually use with abusive content but here in this the context here is not abusive that's why it creates confusion for our classifier because the classifier look to patterns okay so you try to look into each one this one, for example, has the word Aib, al kadib This all bad word, that's why my classifier, for example, understand it as not normal, as abusive, while they have normal. 
label because some of the words that it has are bad word or words that are not normal and sometimes it's actually there is a problem it's just this error is not error from my model it could be error from the data set itself the author that they provide an accurate annotation for their data That's in general what I mean. If you have any question, please let me know. And I'm sorry. It, that's the end of the workshop. Yeah, thank you so much. I think it was amazing, to be honest. Like, I've never seen um, it in depth to that level. So I appreciate um, what you've offered everyone here today. Yeah, what are the other techniques to boost up the accuracy of our model beside the manual error analysis that we did here? Boost the accuracy, it could be by having a development data set, set and to try to experiment with different pre-processing combinations. So you do it in, um, in a binary. Um, so every time you add just one pre-process, and you run the experiment and check the results that you have in your accuracy. And then you add the second debris process step and then you check if there is any improvement. Sometimes there is no improvement. I, I have some experience with some debris processing step that actually reduce the performance of the classifier instead of increasing the performance. So debris processing is not always good. Okay. So that's something really very good to do.